Hey, it's Nathan Crane, creator of the Search for Sustainability documentary series, and I'm very excited to be welcoming you to episode number two of this 12 episode empowering documentary series about sustainability and looking at sustainability from all facets of life. I think what you'll come to learn throughout this series is that we're just not talking about the ecology uh, and biological sustainability as many people think about when they hear sustainability. We're looking at every facet of sustainability. All the systems, economic, the finances, the healthcare, the political, um, even our own individual mental and emotional sustainability because the reality is if a system is unsustainable then it means it cannot go on indefinitely and as Kate Sorensen said in one of our episodes she said if there's a good alternative to sustainability then what is it right is unsustainability a good alternative no of course not so there is no alternative to sustainability. There is only sustainability and going beyond that to a place of regeneration and to a place of thriving. And that's what I hope you will get as a benefit from watching this series. So episode number two is all about food, soil, and water. I mean, some of the most critical issues we're faced with right now as a collective global society is our degradation of food systems being genetically modified, being filled with chemicals and pesticides, and also being eliminated by agrochemical and monocrop food production systems because of the depletion of the soil and the nutrients and the microbes in the soil. One of the other issues we're facing is the water, and not only the water being polluted, but you know, in many places where there was an abundance of water, now that water is disappearing. And so in this episode, we not only look at what's going on and why it's going on, but what you can do about it and empower you to take back control of your food supply, take back control of your water supply, take back control of your life simply by being in more directive and more control of your food and water supply and all while looking at the health of the soil. I recently saw a statistic that said if we continue the way we're going with our current farming and agricultural practices, it seems that within about 60 years there will not be enough healthy topsoil to continue growing food for the people who eat food on a mass scale, which includes most of us, right? That's a little scary because that, that means in, in most of our lifetimes watching this, or at least in your children and grandchildren's lifetime, means that there's a possibility that there won't be enough good topsoil to actually grow food. I mean, could you imagine your children not being able to even eat? What would they do, right? No, we don't want to imagine that. Why? Because we need to change it right now. We need to do something about it right now. We need to empower ourselves to regenerate the soil, to create healthy topsoil, to make good soil, to help revitalize the life of the microbes in the soil, and to help revitalize the nutrient density of the soil because that directly impacts the nutrient density of the food. You're going to learn all about this and a lot more in tonight's episode. So I highly encourage you to get your friends and family together share this with the people in your community watch this together think about it contemplate it learn from it and let's go out and make a difference all right here's episode two enjoy
give thanks for this I know that when my parents were growing up, they grew up during the Depression. And so you had, you needed to have your own garden. You needed, you didn't have the opportunity to waste anything because people were so poor very, you know, very much during the Depression. So it became that they had to do it. And then we've kind of gone through a period of, of plenty and we've become wasteful. We've also taken old technologies that were important, like coal-fired plants, and now we're at a point where we're saying, you know, the new crisis is not the depression. The new crisis is sustainability of the whole planet. We're the first generation to experience um, global warming and climate change. And as the governor of Washington State says, and we're probably the last generation to be able to do something about it. I know that um, when I went to college, in the um, 70s that I was involved in a school called New College at the University of Alabama. It's kind of a college within a college. And part of what we did was we would have seminars on the future of what the world's going to be like. And we read things about zero pop the population bomb. We read a number of, of books and discussions about the prediction of global warming. That was in the 70s. You know, people don't believe it. Um, not, you know, certainly the things that we've done around superbugs because of what we've done with our, um, our livestock, all these things that really a lot of scholars had said, this is what's going to happen if we don't change. And so, you know what? It's happening exactly like they said, if not in some ways, a little worse. I mean, if you want to talk about sustainability, um, how fragile are our current food systems? Are they sustainable? I mean, we, we look at them, we hear about how our soils are being depleted of organic matter, and, like, uh, and we've seen, well, I've seen, and I imagine most of the world has not seen the images of farms where it's like, we farmed here for 50 years, and in the last 10 years, it's like, you know, our crops just got really pathetic. And now it's like, if we were to try and grow anything on this patch of land this year, the cost of what we'd have to put into the soil is greater than the amount of money we would get from it, including with subsidies. And if there's anything, I would say the sustainable living aspect is, first off is, who said that who is it that said that food had a price tag? Really, let's get down to this. When did food come with a price tag? Food comes with seeds. So we have corporations like Monsanto that decide that, that food is no longer a commodity that's given to us by the universe, the cosmos, at our fingertips. We have seeds that are free, but companies that own these seeds and decide to modify them and to make them actually to not yield new seeds after the fruit grows, but to terminate so that you cannot grow anything unless you purchase the seeds from this company. But yet and still, we let a company like Monsanto even exist, when obviously that this company's only mission is to make enormous amounts of money so that not the workers who work in it, so that the CEOs at the top of the pyramid get to sit up and buy bigger cars, bigger boats, better whores, and better drugs. I'm just being honest, right? So that's the reality that we live in. And we support this illusion by giving into it and believing in it. Well, you know what the fascinating thing is, is when I got into this, I got into it out of, of fear that of collapse. And what has happened to me, the transformation has been amazing over the years that as I've gained the skills to grow my own food, my own sense of self-worth, my own sense of self-esteem, 
uh, how I move in my body, my health has improved dramatically, and the spiritual connections that I'm, I'm making and the depth of experience spiritually has just been tremendous. In fact, you know, I'm way past the whole gloom and doom experience now, and I love this. I wouldn't trade it for anything. This is a lifestyle you've been wanting all your life. <laughs> it really is. The, my quality of life has so drastically improved since starting this lifestyle. I was not, I'm not a slow person. I'm a fast, get it done type of person. And so I've really learned to slow down. I'm not saying I slow down all the time, but I've slowed down a lot. Uh, and just to enjoy the simpler things. That might sound cliche, but it's really the truth. Um, learning how to enjoy the taste of a vegetable from the garden. Uh, taking time to, to look at the land around us or appreciate how the grass is growing because of our wet spring. Um, the quality of life is absolutely fantastic and it has really changed my outlook. It's made me appreciate nature more, the natural rhythms of things, um, watching how everything works together. So that's been a really huge benefit for me and it's really what keeps me going even though sometimes homesteading can be a little bit tough during these different seasons. I would really love to see more people get involved with growing their own food, farming their own food. Not everybody has to have a farm in the middle of Texas. But growing your own food is truly essential. And what if something were to happen to our food system one day? Nobody would have food because everybody is relying on packaged goods. But the one thing you can rely on is your own soil. You can rely on your own skills to grow it, your own land. So even if you live in an apartment, you can still grow you know, a few herbs yourself or greens yourself hydroponically and really get to know you know, what you're growing in your food. Fresh is always best. When you eat fresh live foods, you feel so much better. <laughs> if you look at the structure of food in America, it is a very centralized system of control by a few key corporations. Elsewhere in the world, even places like Cuba, they have more of a decentralized food system where more people do home gardening, more people save seeds and share seeds, because it's less centralized, in other words, more redundant, it is, in essence, more secure. Cuba has greater food security than America, a nation that is obsessed with national security. And yet our food system is highly vulnerable because it has single points of failure. If one of these big companies like Cargill, for example, fails to be able to produce food, or one of these crops, such as genetically modified corn, suffers a systemic failure, then we have a, a tidal wave of collapse across the food system, either mass starvation or price inflation, or food companies even going out of business because they can't get the materials anymore. That is not a system of sustainable food for a population. That is a system that is a high risk system, highly vulnerable to systemic failure, and also makes high vulnerability for starvation of the population. And yet this is what dominates our food system today. It is a travesty of economics and of social justice at the same time. We should be encouraging people to grow food in their own front yards and backyards and to grow food locally so that we have more farmers markets. We have more seed sharing and seed saving locally, more raw milk production from farms without them being raided at gunpoint and arrested and thrown in jail for violating some crazy food law that, that shouldn't exist in the first place. We need to encourage local food production and discourage the risks that come from centralized food control by corporations. We, we geofrack because we say we need jobs. So we poison the water that we're running out of so that we can, you know, mine for gasoline and mine, excuse me, mine for uh, uh, gas and, uh, but to poison our strategic water reserves. The, the water for future generations. What's that water's gone? It's gonna take hundreds of years to get back. And, and it's not gonna be the same kind of water because we've also contaminated the soil. From soil erosion, I could just keep going on and on. So in preface, oh, we're going to survive this, we're going to, what are you going to survive? You're not going to survive anything, you know, because you're not going to have a world that's worthy to survive on. And if, and if we're not engaged in the process of fixing the problems that we've created, then, you know, it's kind of moot. It's almost like a joke. So, I mean, I'm at a point now where 
my, myself and my colleagues, you know, we got my colleagues here, that we're looking to develop new practical solutions. And as I know that, uh, you know, this is something that you want to do to get these ideas out here for people to recognize that this is the last run. This is it. This is the last run. I got a 16-year-old kid, so my job is to do it everything that I can to, to at least try to help him have a world that is somewhat similar to what I have. Yeah, water is our scarcest resource here, so we treat it very consciously. And so the first step is that we collect rainwater from all of our roofs, and we have, um, we have two large tanks, uh, one 2,500 and one 2,000 gallon tank that are connected with piping underground. Um, that's our main collection system, and the tanks are opaque, so light doesn't get in, and algae won't grow, and we can store uh, our rainwater for a long period of time in these tanks. And we have a tank gauge that shows us how much water is in the tanks, and it's, it's right outside our front door. So we can have a good, a good check on our water supply, just like you always want to know generally how much money you have in your bank account so that you don't overdraw your savings, right? So we always want to know how much water we have in our savings and so we can use it appropriately. And so sometimes we're conserving for sure, and but sometimes we have an abundance of water and the water's overflowing. In that case, we would take a very long shower. So, you know, sometimes people talk about sustainability and, and they talk about how important conservation is, and this is true, but I think what's more important than just generally being conservative is having a relationship with your resources. So you know how much you have and you know you're using an appropriate amount according to how much you have. So I'm standing in a swale that when it rains, it gathers water and fans it out so it can soak in. And then the fruit trees are planted along that. And this swale actually has a drop of a f one foot for every hundred feet of run. So the big pond at the top that we'll see in a minute, we can open a valve and then the water will zigzag down through these things into that pond, into another swale, into another pond, across a five acre meadow, into another gully. So instead of the water you know, running down the valley, which is what gravity does, we were playing Aikido with water, where we're like, okay, we can't stop it. You're a force more powerful than us, but we can slow you down so you have more beneficial influence within the system and then really you create what is the circulatory system of the farm. And then over time, you know, the, the earth is able to store water underground in conjunction with these tree roots. And we, we came up with things like, you know, bicycle driven washing machines and stuff like that. But, but the most important thing was water purification. And so our primitive engineers on the task, we basically decided that the best way we could teach it was to use local materials. So we could teach it to people to make for themselves. And, and time and time again, we really came back around to slow sand water filtration. I love slow sand filtration. It's 99.9% .9 filtration. It's as good any of the water you drink from that, no matter how poor it is to begin with. When you get it out the other side, it's going to be as good as anything you're drinking from any American tap, and really better because it's not going to have a bunch of chemicals in it either. And so for that, we use sand and char and, and uh, gravel and charcoal. It's that simple. However, the setup of it is, in practice, a little more difficult. Um, because there's a couple things you have to have. One is you have to have a drip rate that is slow enough that you can actually filter that water. And what I mean by that is your sand, which has to be a certain depth, and in, in the case of a 55 gallon barrel it has to be about 34 inches deep, so 34 inches of sand, which is a lot of sand, uh, the top layer of that, at the very top, we form what we call a, you know, a filter cake. It's a, basically a living filter of bacteria and other organisms that feed off of the uh, dirty water that's coming through. So that takes about three weeks or you know, about 21 days for that to really form. So between the time that you create the filter and the time that the water is really clean is about 21 days. With that said, I have set up water filtration systems in places that were, the water was absolutely disgusting. I mean, it was pure, it was literally crap, right? I mean, you're talking about groundwater that was so polluted from septic systems, it was literally crap. And, 
when you get done with this, you know, when our team would get done with something, you know, I'm the leader and we've got water coming out and it looks clean and everybody's looking at you like, okay, so you tell me I got to wait three weeks, but you know, really, come on, you know? And so who has to drink the water? I get to drink the water. And so I've done that. I've drunk, I've drunk water through that system. The first time it was just, you know, a leap of faith because <laughs> no filter, you know, there was no biological filter yet. It was, it was you know, a, a day or two old and, uh, you know, you know, cheers and drink it. I've never, ever had a problem. I mean, I've been sick down there from things like food poisoning, but never, ever from the water, ever, for, you know, ever from the water out of our filters, filtration systems. We have to first start with raising people who actually understand the natural world, who are actually going to work with it, who are going to use all of the amazing resources that we have all around us to our advantage. And then we can really start to progress our society. Um, so that's been a huge thing. The way that water moves through landscapes, so many different epiphanies for there. When you really start to get a handle on this stuff, you can start to see not only what a landscape currently is, but what it used to be and ways in which it has been changed. And with those kind of ideas in your head, driving along every roadway I've ever been down, you can see how the watershed has been severely disturbed. Uh, you can see how these changes in the hydration of the soil are making more severe weather events, both drought, flood, fire, all these different natural catastrophes are the direct result of human management strategies that have been designed to take water away from the land, to put our fertility into the ocean. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard to pencil it in on any one thing, but I think the biggest thing is just that all of the solutions are so simple. They're so logical. They make sense to a two-year-old. It's just a matter of reworking the, the consciousness of humans so that we start to actually do, participate with these systems in a way so that nature and time are always working to our advantage, not our detriment. We are rapidly drawing down and destroying natural waterways for irrigation of crops for swimming pools and for recreation, watering green lawns. We need to change this attitude in parts of the United States, the West, for example, where droughts are severe. There are new techniques for water conservation and clean water production. So until we find a way to take the water and the air and the food that we need to survive and use them without leaving them worse than we found them, then we will never have attained sustainability. So the sustainability of agriculture, of food production is gonna lead the way. That's where we must start. The astonishing truth in all of this is that answers are readily available, they're right at our fingertips. And yet, for some reason, there's so much resistance in society to doing things yourself. Uh, sometimes when people hear me talk about growing your own food, they, they, they chuckle, I'm like, oh, what are you going back to the 1950s where everybody grew their own food? And the answer is yes, yes, we are going back to that. Why not grow some of our own food? In fact, in the 1940s and 50s, we had victory gardens. You know, the government actually encouraged people to grow their own food as a form of national defense and food reliability and food security because there were food shortages. There were government food lines. We were in a state of war. There were risks. There were threats to our food supply. And the answer was grow your own food. It's the smart thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And it saves our country from these systemic risks. That message is just as true today as it was in 1942. We should be growing our own food, and it's easier than ever to do it because of all these modern technological advances and systems that work amazingly well, like the Kratky food system, non-circulating hydroponics, grows food for pennies. And you can do it, if you, if you can punch the buttons on a microwave oven, you could grow your own food for pennies on the dollar. It's that easy. People used everything in their surroundings to feed themselves and their families.
And we need to go back to that because, unfortunately, we've worn out the dirt. We've literally worn the soil out. And so in order to keep producing, they put more and more chemicals on it and more and more chemicals. Well, the thing is, is when you have produce, wheat, strawberries, whatever you want to name, that what they keep doing every week is spraying it with Roundup. The research is back from the World Health Organization. Roundup has created a situation where that's the reason we have so much autism. That's the reason we're having so much trouble with infertility, with dead fetuses in animals as well as humans. This isn't the good news. It's like, whoa, back up a little bit. I want to grow my own food because I don't want that stuff in it. I want to grow my own food because then I know what I'm eating, what my grandchildren are eating, what my kids are eating. And you need to know these days. And I feel it's very important in today's day and age to start growing our own food because the global impact that it has is huge on the planet. And it's really unfortunate. I live in this pristine environment in Vilcabamba, Ecuador. And living there is incredible. As I was saying, the air quality is amazing. The skies are blue. There's no chemtrails or anything like this. And I almost forget about it by living, because I live there and I see it all the time. So when I come back to the United States every once in a while, and I, have to, I experience everything that's going on here, we're in trouble, guys. We really got to hand, handle this. The skies are not blue. It's mucky. I could feel, I could taste the particles in the air. And it seems like right now is the time to start making an effort to being sustainable into this type of direction. I noticed a theme of people who had uh, children who maybe didn't fit in the conventional boxes, maybe got labeled with some of those letters um, of learning disabilities or something. And I could kind of read the story of like, well, honey, it's going to be okay. We'll get a little piece of land, we'll grow a garden, and we'll be normal. Because that's one of the most normal things we can do. Everywhere on the planet, people grow food. Peasant agriculture feeds most of the world, not industrial farming. That's a total myth. 70% of the food consumed on the planet is grown by peasant agriculture, people doing it really simple with their family. So that's one thing I, you know, really work with the young people here uh, to, to get, like, this modern thing that we, we call society is, is it's, it's a, a new experiment. And the way people have been doing it for a long time was with their family and um, being resourceful and creative. So as far as growing our food here, we have a few different techniques that we use. One is uh, we grow, we have perennial beds that, so in permaculture, perennial food systems are really important because once you get them started, then they don't need as much maintenance to keep going and provide food for you. So for example, we have our Jerusalem artichoke bed and we have our um, asparagus bed that are, to, originally to make these beds, we dug out the soil really deep, like two and a half feet deep, three feet deep, and we use the subsoil to make a bermed pathway on the lower side. So that way we're harvesting any storm water that comes off of the hill into this bed and there's a containment. And then we uh, improve the soil a lot by adding compost and manures and we keep the soil really good because we don't have enough water here to um, water things and have them not be healthy, you know. So we, we make sure the soil is really good. In some places we have shade protection and wind protection. And that really helps us in this high desert environment to conserve water. Uh, we also have oyas that are unglazed clay pots that we set into the ground and water into them. And then the water seeps through the pots and waters. It's a timed release system to water the plants. The reason I use different options or different methods in the garden in part is to show students different ways of growing when they go home. There's some places in the country where the soil um, is difficult to work with and in a raised bed you can put weed barrier down so that um, things like Bermuda grass have more difficulty getting into the raised bed and here I put chicken wire underneath it so that the gophers don't get into the raised beds and then by 
uh, choosing how you mix the soil, you, you can determine its qualities and properties. The reason we have the objective of growing half of your own food is it's a substantial amount. Half of your own food means you're going to see dramatic increases in your health and vibrancy right away. Uh, and it's actually fairly easy, it is easy to do. It's why we focus on what we focus uh, on. It, it does not require a huge amount of skill. It's something that you can learn. Will you make mistakes? Absolutely. But is it completely possible? In fact, I can show you how. I've shown thousands of people how, uh, and lots of people are doing it. Very simple, you know, very simple. Get a couple of chickens, start collecting some eggs, raise some rabbits, um, you know, have a small 200 square foot garden. You'll be amazed at what you can produce and how good you feel. For me, the time out in the garden and working with the livestock is my most precious time during the day. Like, it's really, uh, it's a downtime in that, you know, I'm not like focused on getting things done, but I am getting things done. So it's that wonderful, and then the gentle movement and the stretching, it, it's like yoga and Zen while I'm still producing something. We all, quite frankly, have busy lives and we want to be producing something. So why not kind of have a slower, more relaxed time and be producing your food? It, it's totally something you can do. This is important work. Um, connecting with your food and ensuring that future generations can also buy food from the hand of someone who grew it and taste what food should taste like in its season. Um, I'm old enough to remember Charlton Heston and Soylent Green, and, you know, the, the sort of 60s, you know, apocalyptic view of the future where there was no food and everything was synthetic. And, you know, sometimes I worry that we could be headed in that direction until I wake up and come to a farmer's market and see that real food is being grown by real people according to seasonality that is important to this climate. One great reason to eat local foods is because local food grows where you grow. For example, I live in Ashland, Oregon, and if I were to pick a dandelion from Ashland, Oregon, that dandelion has to deal with the same bacteria and the same environment, the same you know, climate that I do. And so it's better acclimated for me. So I'm essentially eating the perfect food in the perfect area for my needs. And I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, I want to just duplicate nature's system in my garden and how like a forest would work. Nobody goes and spreads fertilizer on the forest, yet the trees are huge, plants are thriving everywhere. Uh, we planted, I believe, 34 different varieties. So there are apples and apricots, pears, plums, figs, uh, walnuts, pecans, cherries, um, almonds. So uh, we wanted to try a, a variety in part to be able to see what does well here. Um, I planted some low chill hour varieties. Um, if our climate continues to warm, um, that'll be uh, important for us. And uh, as with lots of things, diversity helps um, with stability. And some things, we have late frosts here, so if trees bloom at different times, um, you, may, you may get fruit on some and others may get frosted out if they bloom at different times. My task here is to help everything that I can bring life force through it. It isn't just to grow something and have it be adequate. It's that every single thing on our farm, including the people, have this experience of being the fullest we possibly can be with life force. There is a lot of new ways of dealing with gardens, no dig gardening and Google culture and lasagna gardening and so on and so forth. Well, the newest wrinkle that I've heard in this is the Bio-Nutrient Association is showing you how to put rock dust down instead of fertilizer and let the plants pick what they need and what they want. And when they have all the basic little nutrients they need from rock dust, insects can't digest them. They come, they look at them, they smell them, they go away because they can't digest the plant. I have people uh, uh, who are now growing gardens and 
big farms, organic farms, using the rock dust, the bio-nutrients, and they see a Japanese beetle come and sit on a plant next to the garden, and it goes away. If they find a plant that's diseased, they get rid of the whole plant. They don't try and treat it because they know if it's disease is eating the plant, bugs are eating the plant, it's no good for human consumption. We shouldn't be eating it. If they can digest it, it's not good for us. Our greenhouse is a gray water uh, using greenhouse. We have a bed of perennials or, or annuals that act like perennials in the greenhouse, like kale and chard and parsley. We have an abundance of those things in our bed as well as different herbs. And so the water from our house goes into the greenhouse bed and goes into a pumice wick through the middle and absorbs into this bed and the plants suck it up and produce food for us. So this is what I've really settled on as far as a greenhouse design. I've done a lot of different ones and this one is the one I think that has worked out the best. Um, so it's much different than what you read about as a passive solar greenhouse. And that's because experience has dictated that this is what actually works best. So we have a 312 roof pitch, so that we're actually catching a lot of the summer sun, because long term in this greenhouse we'll really be growing perennials. Figs, pineapple guava, nectarines, things that are going to be lower maintenance, uh, they're going to be much more sustainable and even regenerative as far as the soil is concerned, and they also produce a really great food that you can't otherwise eat. Um, and so we actually want that summer sun, hence the shallow roof pitch, so that we're catching that sun and putting it into fruit. Then you see all the vertical glass, and this is because in the winter when the sun is low, the glass is letting in almost all of the light. The glazing on the top actually blocks about 20% of the light, and that's good in the summer because it helps us with our cooling. Uh, and then the windows to the south let in all of the light, but they don't let out as much heat because most of the heat goes through your roof. And so here we're dug down insulated stem wall around the perimeter. So we're six feet down into the ground, insulated on the edges, but not the bottom. So we're getting that ground temperature both in summer and winter, 45 degrees feeding into the greenhouse, warming it in the winter, cooling it in the summer. Both are very important. Then we've got 30 inch beds on top of that. And in the floor below these beds, there's a bunch of pipe laid out all throughout the floor of the greenhouse. And what's happening is hot air from the roof of the greenhouse is coming down this pipe into a barrel here that spreads it into four different pipes that run throughout the floor of the greenhouse and over to a fan in that corner that draws air through the whole system. Now what this does is a lot of days in the spring and the fall, when we would have to vent the greenhouse because it's getting too warm because there's so much sun, now we're actually taking that hot air and blowing it down through the ground, condensing the moisture, putting a lot of heat in the ground. And so we're gaining temperature from the greenhouse being buried below into the ground. And then we're also gaining temperature from taking the extra hot air, blowing it through the floor of the greenhouse. Now in the summer when it gets too hot, what we have is these fans that are pulling the hot air out. Once this system is not enough to cool the greenhouse, and then we have earth tubes coming in through here. You see these air inlets. What these are doing is taking air from outside, drawing it down along the footing of the foundation for 20 feet, and then into the greenhouse. So what we're getting is instead of drawing in the hot 80, 90 degree air to try and cool the greenhouse, we're drawing in 60 degree air that's already been cooled by the ground before it comes in here. So the cold frame, the cold frame is a way that we produce food in the winter and um, food can grow all year round in this uh, microclimate. And we use these, uh, these bottles of water along the back of the wall to absorb the heat of the sun and help hold that heat through the night. And then, so a cold frame, in the winter, you close it at night so it stays nice and warm, and then you open it during the day so that your plants don't bake. Um, and so we have this passive solar cold frame tender, and it opens and closes our cold frame for us. 
And how it works is it has this, um, this blue water container and the sun comes up in the morning, it hits this water container, it pressurizes the water, it pressurizes it into steam and it pushes water up this tube that goes all the way to the bottom of this jug into this, it goes through this vinyl tube up into this other jug that was a vinegar jug and it acts as a counterweight. So when a half or three quarters of a gallon of, of water gets pushed up into this other container, it creates weight and it pulls down the back of the cold frame and it opens the cold frame itself. And then when the sun goes down at the end of the day, it, there's a vacuum that's created in the blue tank and it sucks the water back in so that the cold frame closes by itself. So in 1991, I wrote a book called Backyard Composting and we sold a million copies and I traveled all over, all over America and set up 700 home composting programs uh, where we distributed composting books composting bins and did, did workshops and so really helped, uh, helped do that for about five years. And one of the things we noticed, a lot of people came to the workshops who live in the city, like the city of LA, we put 25,000 people through our workshops, is people would have what I call the ick factor. And, and it's like they would say, oh, is there earthworms in my, in my soil? Is that what's gonna happen? Say that earthworms are our friend, but people have this aversion, this disconnect from nature. And, and that's really what's underlying the problems we're facing today um, is that people essentially are, are very eco-illiterate. I, I like to say that in America is the most eco-illiterate society that on the face of the earth and ever in history. And just the concept of soil, health, or natural systems is just, is like, it's like going to the Amazon and, and thinking some tribe that has no contact with the Western world will understand English. So, and, and this, is, this has been, been a, a process that's gone on for, for, for really, you know, hundreds of years and people become disconnected. And, and so, you know, spending more time in nature and, and just learning, um, um, and we can see, are you gonna get healthier by going take a pharmaceutical drug? Or can we learn to, in, to you know, enjoy the seeds or nuts or herbs or fruits or other tip, different types of fruits, you know, or other different types of vegetables that we can do that will, that will heal our body instead of reaching for that pharmaceutical drug, which will only then potentially make us more toxic by taking it. It might help in one aspect, you know, um, it's just like all these doctors now are recommending satin, you know, satin drugs um, for, for cholesterol. Um, and making cholesterol the, the, the boogeyman, you know, which is, which, is, which is ridiculous. And that's one of the things I've noticed is, is that when I started selling, comp, um, started selling coconut oil in, in, the, in like 2003, everyone said, oh, coconut oil is a saturated fat, it's gonna cause heart disease. That was, I used to hear that all the time. But if you go to Sri Lanka, if you go to, the, to Thailand, do you see people who are very overweight? The people are thin, you know, healthy. Um, and they eat the most coconut oil of, of, of almost anyone, but they don't have heart disease. But in America, we eat the most unsaturated fat from corn and soy and canola, and yet we have the, the highest heart disease um, and, and obesity in, in the world. And one out of four of our kids are, are obese today. Something's wrong with our food system. No society has ever survived that doesn't respect the topsoil. Societies that have disregarded the topsoil have uh, all disappeared. That's just a historical fact. And we're, in this, in the United States, are down to about six inches of topsoil. We started with about two feet. So it's like, oh my goodness. So right now we have an opportunity to start to rebuild the topsoil by going organic. So with one simple act of organic farming, we have created a whole cascade of sustainability. The whole thing is, it's, it's simple. You, we are what we eat and absorb, and our soil and our plants, or our plants are actually what the soil has in it and absorbs and is able to uptake. So if uh, conventional agriculture is just putting in like a bag fertilizer with three primary 
but up to maybe uh, 16 to 18 different minerals. Those are all the minerals that that plant is going to have, unless it's already existing in the soil that's already been, uh, you know, used to grow a lot of food. And the example that I got once was simply this, like you take a rainforest and it's really fertile, the trees are huge and everything is growing lush and beautifully because it's nature's system that's recycling nutrients that has beneficial microbes in the soil and they strip it down, which I'm not an advocate for. They strip it down to grow corn or soy or whatever crops to feed animals because animal agriculture takes the most amount of input of any kind of food produced. And the first couple years, they'll have incredible yields because the soil is really fertile. They'll pull off all the crops and take tonnage and truckloads and truckloads off. And meanwhile, they bring like maybe a pallet of bag fertilizers to put back in. So there's no way they could replace what was there when they're pulling off tonnage and tonnage and tonnage and putting in a couple pallets or you know, a couple bags of, of fertilizer in. It, the, it's, it's, a, it's an equation that just doesn't work, right? So my goal with gardening is to add in more to my soil than what was there. And you know, like when I try to stay, when I stay with friends and pe friends and family and whatnot, I always try to leave their place a little bit nicer than when I came, right? It's just like, I just wanna be able to respect others and respect this planet. Soil that's free draining, that's a new one for me because I'm on, I'm on clay soil that drains just fine, but it has a tendency to become compacted and drain less than free draining. But I do have some subsoil condition which I might have found had I been a little more aggressive with a process they call potholing. So we dig a hole over in that corner, over there, in the middle, over in this corner, in that corner, and then we get kind of a soil profile. We can see what's in the hole. Is there gravel in this hole or is there gravel in that hole? Because that's where they filled. And so there are, there are um, processes that you can do to investigate subsoil as well as recording what's above ground. So there are lots and lots of techniques for growing soil. One of the most classic ones is cover cropping. Um, for example, I like to grow uh, rye and clover a lot in the wintertime. Rye makes this massive root system, which, you know, in the, you can either harvest the rye for the seed, which I really am not into raising grains that much because it's a lot of work. What I'm mostly interested in is that massive root system down in the ground. When I cut that rye down, that root system stays in there and slowly decomposes, and that's the beginning of my soil. Uh, it's actually a lot easier to grow soil by growing plants than it is um, in, in other ways. Having livestock on the soil enhances the, the ability of the plants to grow because the, there's that whole cycle of nature. You know, the, the, the waste of the animal is the food source for the plants, and the plants are the food source for the animal. So even people who are vegans and vegetarians often need to have animals in their system just for the fertility that the animals bring. I thought there's got to be some way that makes sense, that is environmentalism, environmentalist thinking, environmental thinking that will do it. And I looked into how the environmental movement got started and went back to John Muir. And John Muir was, and he called himself a religious fundamentalist. He believed in original sin. He believed if you reduce the impact of humans on any place, it automatically got better. And so, you know, his, his whole idea for making the environment healthy is to redo the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Uh, and that is, that's what, what our environmentalism is based on. It's really kind of amusing, though, that uh, not many folks know about or talk about. There was a woman named Mary Austin who was around at the same time Muir was when he was up in the Sierras doing all his talk about protection and stuff. And one of the things he wanted to protect it from were the sheep herders that came up there. And Mary Austin, was, uh, uh, she was observant enough to say, wait a minute, those sheep, they're interacting with the land. They're they're getting from the land, they're giving to the land, uh, and she says, they're the reason the wildflowers are looking so good. Says they actually, and I'm thinking, how does this make sense? And then I ran across the idea of, uh, oh, they came from NASA. Uh, and uh, when we first thought about going to Mars, there was, um, NASA got in touch with some biologists and said, is there any way we can tell that a planet has life on it before we go there. I'm wondering if they could tell if Mars might have some life on it before we go there. So they put a couple of uh, biologists in charge of it. First was uh, uh, John uh, Lovelock and then uh, 
Also, uh, Lynn Margulis, who was Carl Sagan's wife, got involved in it too. And they start thinking, well, you know, if, if there's something on the planet that can only be there if it's sustained by, if it can't happen just quote unquote naturally, or if the only way it can happen if something is making it happen, then something has to be making it happen. And things that make things happen is what we call life. So he came up with the idea that living creatures create like plants, create the oxygen here on Earth. That we have the conditions for life on Earth because the living things have evolved to produce it, to make it. Life sustains life. Life makes the conditions for life. So all of a sudden I'm thinking about life, and I'm thinking about these guys that are using these cows to go out on the land, and they interact with the land in, 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 a, in a way that replicates what this fellow saw in Africa among the wildebeest and, and the Serengeti over there. They do the same thing here, and everything prospers. I mean, I've been in places where these herds of cattle have been moving across, and you can see rabbit trails. You can even, there's enough, the rabbits are using the trails enough so you can see where the rabbit trail crosses the cow trail. And, and the rabbits are out there grazing and going with the cows. It, it, it's really amazing, the interaction that you get to see. I think here is a much more functional basis for environmentalism than, you know, man is a blight on everything, everywhere. That is what Muir said. But this says that if we work together in the right ways, we actually sustain life in a more effective way. That, to me, is the real definition of sustainability. The example I like to give is the soil to plants is like the relationship we have, um, you know, with the bacteria in us. So they say that we are actually more bacteria than human, you know, in sheer vo in numbers, right? And so is the soil. In like one teaspoon of soil, there's like more microbes than there are people on Earth. I mean, it's insane how many microbes are in the soil. And it's the microbes that are responsible and there's other creatures that I see crawling around. <laughs> um, there are the microbes that are responsible for basically taking the organic matter and the minerals and converting them into a form that the plants could use. And the same thing with us. You know, there was a talk yesterday on prebiotics and people are talking about microbes. And the microbes, you know, they're in our intestines and you've had antibiotics that wipes them all out, just like conventional fertilizers, you know, will wipe out and decrease the microbes in the soil so that the system is broken. And when we eat broken foods that don't feed our microbial growth, like processed foods, animal foods, we don't work well. So that's why we need plant foods that have the fiber, the inulin, um, the fructo, all the other saccharides that feed our microbes and also take some microbes in us. So, I mean, that's what I focus on us because our immune system and our digestive is, is dependent on the microbes. And same with the uptake of the nutrients from the soil into the plants are dependent on the microbes. If we just leave nature alone, um, she will build nutrients into the system. If you just let land lay fallow for a year, it will have more nutrients after that year than it was, did before that you let it go fallow. And we know all of our traditional gardening and farming techniques deplete nutrients out of the system. So the difference is a whole soil ecosystem, which is a complete set of organisms that can hold on to the nutrients through complete growth, decay, and regrowth cycles. Um, and when you till the soil, you're, just, you're uh, destroying that habitat and you start losing species out of the system. And now there's, um, when a species dies, there is no longer the species that can take up those nutrients and continue them in the cycle. When I first visited China in 1985, our tour guides would stop us on the path to move a little, little worm or something out of the way so we wouldn't step on it. I'd never seen that sort of thing, and that really changed me a lot when I just saw the reverence that they paid for the little microbes. And they understood that the microbes are our soil. And uh, they knew that all along, and so they, they nourished them and nurtured them. And of course, then if you have a, one family tending a piece of land the size of this hotel room, they can go and pick off all the aphids by hand and do all the get rid of the nematodes and all that and help protect the plants, you know, through human interventions. And then they're working symbiotically with everything. But, you know, there is a worry that China is now, in, within, with the industrialization that's rolling in. Uh, when I was there again in 2007, one of our tour guides said, uh, oh no, we want to modernize, we want to try Western style agriculture, large agriculture. And I said, no. <laughs> but, you know, what can you do, right? I mean, 
progress will go forward in that way, and there's people, there's mouths to be fed. But the one thing I noticed when I was in China, uh, driving from the air, the Shanghai airport, just to Shanghai itself, there's a about a hundred mile drive, and they made this airport like way out there. And in between, if you look at the landscape, everything is gardened. Uh, there is not a piece of land, even if you're on a highway like a, a new highway interchange, underneath it's all plantations of something going on. And you're walking down a path. There's 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 literally you know. Uh, little gardens going alongside the path with everything's meticulously little bo little bamboo uh, trellises and everything meticulously held, kept there little clay pots sitting there you know to ferment stuff in it's it's miraculous how much the soil is 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 the is the base of chinese civilization you know now as we we can learn from this from them because when we look at our soil here we've had this I don't know, the first term that comes to mind is like happy-go-lucky, like, just, hey, just plant there as long as you can plant and go somewhere else, right? But the, if you go on like a satellite map and just close in on the landscape around the big cities, around Beijing, around Shanghai, look at the micro-farming, the intensity of the farming. Is it incredible? So every little, ha every little apartment, every little house has their own little field. And these, this is the way that they've lived for thousands of years. And, and we can learn this as we go forward into a permaculture mentality here, is that if we're all living in a food forest that is a continuous, but yet we're kind of like nourishing and living in symbolically with our immediate food forest, and then the person next door is living, living in symbiosis with their immediate food forest, and we're like pitching avocados to each other for mangoes, right? You know, that's gonna make a great society. It's gonna change economics and everything. Let's go a little further because sustainability is pretty key when we have a big scare about carbon dioxide. Well, there is no question that the carbon dioxide has gone from 280 parts per million to 385 parts per million. No question. And we're increasing it possibly three parts per million a year. Now, the, the real question is what's the answer to it? And from a sustainability point of view, the Rodale Institute just came out with research showing that uh, organic farming can use all that extra carbon recycling it back into the earth where you need it. How complicated is that? The truth is an organic farm per acre will pull out 3,700 pounds of carbon dioxide out of the air per year. And if you're into avocados, which I love avocados, you're going to pull out 5,200 pounds of carbon dioxide per acre per year. Now, when you understand this level, uh, the clear, simple answer, if you're not playing politics and wanting to uh, not create a sustainable world, is to increase organic farming. Easy solution in their calculations is when we have enough organic farms, it becomes a non-issue. So we're not talking about what we call climate change, whether we have global cooling or warming, it doesn't matter. We clearly know there's an increase in carbon dioxide. And we want to use it to recycle and build the soil. That's called sustainability. That's what we're doing with the organic veganic farming, is we're creating a way of life that's sustainable. Yeah, my dad actually is retired now and he owns an organic farm in Taiwan and it's all biodegradable you know, permaculture like he uses everything that, you know, doesn't it goes to waste, it goes back to the compost. So it's like this huge cycle. So I've learned a lot from my dad just watching him. Everything we do is organic and we use a lot of uh, pest management too or uh, you know, beneficials for the pests, ladybugs, nematodes, prey mantises, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, everything we, we do everything organically. Bedding plants is hard to get everything organic, cause, like flowers and stuff, because a lot of the growers aren't turned on to that yet. But with this thing with the big box stores poisoning all the bees this year, um, people are really starting to wake up and uh, think about flowers being sustainably grown as well. If you took away the Kim Ag subsidy and the organic ag penalty, then the consumer would pay four times more for the Kim Ag food than they do now. Well, 
they would pay, the consumer would pay four times more for chem ag food than organic ag food. You know, we can start there. You know, um, our, our, uh, how sustainable is that? Like we've got a, we pay for our food at the grocery store and then we pay for it again through taxes. And then if we want to go buy organic food, then they have to pay a penalty to grow organic food. So you're kind of, that's why organic food costs more is because of the penalty. So the foods came to U.S. market despite the warnings of the FDA's own science, despite the laws of the United States. So the, the FDA administrators turned their back on science, violated the law, and that's the only way that genetically engineered foods came, became commercialized. They first became commercialized here in the United States based on that fraud, fraud and that illegal activity. And wherever else in the world they currently are on the market, they're there thanks to that fraud and illegal activity. Because if back in May in 1992, the FDA had, instead of lying to the world, had said, our scientists have studied this issue thoroughly. They've concluded that genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding. The products that it creates from a scientific as well as a legal standpoint must be presumed uh, to entail greater risks. And each one is going to be subjected to rigorous safety testing. That would have killed the whole thing right there. We, I wouldn't be talking with you about this uh, in this interview because no genetically engineered foods would have become commercialized. That would have basically stopped it. Because um, GMO, of course, isn't just food. You know, animals that eat the food get genetically modified. Humans that eat the food get genetically modified. We are becoming the Frankensteins if we allow this to go any further. But we can because we have the consciousness. And the consciousness, again, is supported by the recognition that we can eat the foods that allow our brains to function better, that clear the fog. Raw plant food clears the fog in your brain. <laughs> I mean, it sounds very primitive, but it is so true. So we have those possibilities, and therefore, it is now that we need to do it. So really, the, the whole technology must be abandoned. It's from the standpoint of what we know our best scientific knowledge, our best engineering knowledge, it's really a, a very wrong path. It's a, we should be stopping and moving on, putting all that tremendous resource into safe and sustainable modes of farming, which have been demonstrated in test after test in Africa of the third world nations to be what is needed, creative, small scale, agroecological techniques. If you ask a permaculture person what is permaculture, you're going to get a different answer for each person you ask. Um, I mean, the shortest possible answer is it is a design science, which isn't, you know, really tell you much about what it is. Um, the answer I like to go with these days is Permaculture is a more symbiotic relationship with nature, so I can be even lazier. Um, permaculture is, they call it a design science, and it's a strategy to go through and implement changes on land that are going to bring about greater means for humans. And so there's lots of different takes on permaculture. Uh, and there's lots of different people doing different styles of permaculture, but at the base, it's an ethical framework to design land-based systems off of. I really feel that, that permaculture is, the time is ripe for permaculture, this time, time is ripe for anything really involving sustainability. I think we're becoming more and more aware that we're being faced with a whole series of, of challenges and some of them are, people are calling them predicaments rather than problems because they really can't be solved by conventional means. Things like climate change, uh, things like the increasing cost 
of energy and the fact that there's a finite amount of fossil fuels in the ground and at some point we're going to have used up the ones that are, are easy to get. We're already starting to run into that. Uh, the, the things like the difficulties we're having in healthcare and in the financial system, education, there, there just seems to be this whole suite of problems that we're, we're facing and we really need answers that go outside the box. And disciplines like permaculture, I think, really help us design solutions from a whole new point of view. And I, I got into permaculture 20 years ago because I like the idea of reducing my ecological footprint. I like the idea of living a little more sustainably. And I, I just, I liked its, its principles, its kind of whole systems thinking and that sort of thing. I was just very attracted to it. And it, it for me at that point was kind of a hobby, even though it got to be a full-time profession. But what I've really come to understand and what I'm seeing in a lot of other people is that we, we need to be doing these sorts of things right now. We're kind of running out of time, is, is my sense. We, we have a limited amount of time to really shift over to a more sustainable type of culture. And permaculture is one of the most promising tools. There are a lot of tools, but to me, permaculture is really, really a whole vision, a whole toolkit for dealing with the issues of energy and climate change and social justice and food production and how do we, how do we deal with the droughts that we're having in the U.S. West and things like that. The importance of permaculture is that it provides a framework to organize and hold all these ideas and thoughts and and it's such a brilliant framework. It's, it's the framework that we needed in order to collect our thoughts and organize our thoughts and move forward for everybody and make this. I, I don't think that we would be moving as far forward as we are right now without the organization that came decades ago from Bill Mollison. We are both a permaculture farm and a biodynamic farm. We didn't know anything about either of them uh, 13, now 14 years ago when we started, but we did, we did have a garden and we started thinking, you know, we have all this land here. Uh, maybe we should make something a little bit bigger and maybe there's some ways other people do things like this more organized than our randomness. So I started reading up on permaculture and meeting people and joining uh, groups about permaculture and studying it and it was a, it was a wonderfully organized method that just made so much sense. Now, unlike industrial agriculture, which is capital intensive, permaculture and sustainability farming is knowledge intensive. You can get into it very inexpensively, but you need the knowledge. So I started making that knowledge available by teaching permaculture classes and by uh, founding Wolf Thailand and, and where we have uh, a lot of foreigners actually come. Uh, we got literally thousands of uh, young Americans come into Thailand for a cultural exchange, but they leave with sustainability skills. They learn uh, how to grow their own food. They learn how to build their own houses. Uh, they learn how to farm their own fish. And so while this cultural exchange and adventure is going on, there's also a big transformation in terms of uh, self-empowerment. I got into permaculture design because I wanted to grow gardens. I wanted to learn how to grow gardens without me requiring to maintain them. And I was tired of the food that could only be found in my area. So I decided to just take control of that and start my own gardens. Since Circle of Children has been out at Triangle Lake, we've established two acres of permaculture gardens and food forest. And we've got an abundance of healthy and rich soil that is giving so much life to the land and so much life to the people and the animals that are here sharing this space. And we're gonna continue growing those gardens and continue planting more trees every day and continue planting more seeds in every way. and. Um, and inviting various different groups that have knowledge and how to plant food in the most sustainable way to come out and share those techniques and integrate those techniques into the land here. So one of the most 
mysterious and I think intriguing ideas in permaculture is the idea of guilds. And although a guild can mean, can be used in a lot of different ways, uh, usually we're talking about plant guilds. So a plant guild is a group of plants that comes together to all support one another. And the classic example of a guild is the Native American triad of corn, beans, and squash, where the, the corn acts as a trellis, but it also provides food. The beans twine up that trellis, they provide food, but they also have nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the roots, so they help build fertility. And then the squash acts as a living mulch or ground cover, but it also provides food. And those three plants fit together so well that corn, beans, and squash together will produce more calories of food than the same area grown with either straight corn or straight beans or straight, straight squash because they kind of interlock into each other's empty spaces as a way to think of it. So we've observed these sorts of guilds that have been designed you know, thousands of years ago by indigenous people and we try and design our own. And usually what we do is pick something like a fruit tree, an apple tree, something like that. And then we think, okay, what does that apple tree need? Well, it needs pollination. So we want to bring in insect attracting plants with it, like flowers. And it needs protection from pest insects, from, you know, coddling moth and things like that. So that's another reason to plant flowers, because those will bring in beneficial insects. We want fertility, so we bring in nitrogen fixing plants like clovers and beans and things like that. We might even want mulch plants, plants with big leaf systems to, uh, to drop onto the ground and, and build fertility, build mulch that way. So we try and think of what other plants will fill those needs that that apple tree needs. So most agriculture is just growing weedy annuals or vegetables in arrested succession. So in natural ecologies, there's plant succession. You start with the pioneers, weedy, thorny, usually they have berries, and then it moves towards a more climax ecosystem. So in this ecology, the climax ecosystem would be oaks, pines, firs, you know, this big forest. Um, so, you know, we're not eating acorns and pine nuts you know, and consuming forest products so much in our diet right now. So what, how can we emulate that process? So this is a little plot where we grew vegetables for a number of years. You know, we'd use the tractor and till rows. And then uh, we planted a seed crop of echinacea. We were growing for another seed company, which is a perennial herb, and we were growing the seed. And we grew that for a number of years, and then they didn't need that anymore. And I was like, well, we could dig up all the echinacea, or maybe let's just start planting peach trees in there and raspberries. Here's another young peach tree. and then. Around the trees, you plant a guild, you know, so comfrey and mint, and this is Queen Anne's lace, is a pollinator attracting plant, uh, nectar. And, and stop tilling and stop mowing and allow it to evolve. And now we can look at, we have to do very little work, little pruning, little harvesting, little watering. And we have a whole variety of yields, and then things just show up. This is a seedling plum from probably a bird that sat here and dropped a plum pit. You know, and, and, and that is coming in here. There's uh, sunchokes. There's probably about a dozen species growing in here. And you know, seasonally, there's always something to harvest here, even in winter. There's always something we can go outside and gather. And not only that, it's marching out. You can see the mint and the comfrey are moving out in this meadow. So let me show you my garden. <laughs> I'd enjoy for everybody to see what a diverse ecosystem can look like. This is the beginning stages of a permaculture mindset designed garden. This is basically what it looks like after only a year. And you can see the diversity that's in here. There is at least six different varieties of apples. There's grapes. There's countless berry bushes. I mean, I could rattle off all sorts of berry bushes in there, medicinal berry bushes, and berry bushes which are just great for eating, for the sugar content, the sweetness of it, the grapes, and it's the diversity. So in 2004, I had an opportunity to sell my practice and to be able to focus on what I'm really interested in. And uh, I read the uh, Permaculture Design Manual and I have uh, done no digging ever since. We started doing sheet mulching. Then my first sheet mulch was in 2004. 
And now we've worked our way up to uh, Hugel Mulch is the leading edge of deep mulch gardening technology. And in the Hugel Mulch, we take uh, the biggest material that we can find and use that as a base because that's going to take a long time for this soil ecosystem to break it down. In Hugo cultures, they talk about 30 years of fertility. Um, and then we, uh, we want to be able to plant into those, into the beds. So that's kind of hard to plant into a stump. So we are going to build a uh, wood chip sheet mulch on top of that. So that's another 12 inches of organic matter. And we do have the experience with uh, wood chip sheet mulch. We're going to be able to plant those at least four years in a row without having to add any more material. So we can, uh, we have a system that is creating a habitat for a whole soil ecosystem. So here we've got a Holzer inspired garden uh, where the, the client wanted to have a garden for vegetables, herbs, fruit, but it's their first time ever having a garden. So we wanted to go really small, something easy to manage, something that was also going to start to give them a taste of nature gardening. So the roof water off of the house comes through a pipe into this first tree well. So the first rain basically gives this tree a nice drink. It goes along to the next tree well and then to the third one. And so even in this really dry, harsh, hot, windy climate, the trees you can see are doing really well. They were just planted last year. Then the water comes around into this second terrace where there's a hula culture bed along the terrace. Uh, this year we planted a bunch of medicinal herbs that are starting to sprout up. And then there's a whole nother set of vegetables coming up. Some flowers work really well to give shade in this garden, to bring up moisture from down deep, uh, and then to provide wind protection as well. And so we planted a lot of perennials. Uh, this is a service berry in this case, but all throughout the garden to give us a good test of what's going to survive if we keep the deer off of it. And then we also have some stuff planted around the fence of the garden to see what's going to survive if the deer are munching on it. And so we're starting to develop a strategy for the rest of the property within this fenced garden. Uh, and so then the water comes along after it soaks into this terrace and this hula culture spills into the next one down, uh, which this year is really being used for potatoes and a lot of the main staple crops growing out throughout this hula culture. Here on the slope, we have raspberries, we have different types of uh, medicinal herbs, monarda in this case, and then again, sunflowers that will grow up and provide shade and protection. We've got a lot of cover crops planted all around the perimeter of this garden, providing some extra wind protection, but then it's also our source of fertilizer for the garden. We can basically cut that perimeter along the fence, and because it's all nitrogen fixing legumes, that's really great fertilizer used directly on the plants as mulch. If we look at the Romans, they planted crops that they were familiar with in advance of their conquest in their armies. So by the time their soldiers got somewhere, they already had chestnuts, olives, figs, grapes, things like that, which, you know, maybe we don't, we could do without the military conquest concept, but we want to ensure the continuance of culture by having a food supply that's not so um, reliant on fossil fuels and excessive effort. And that's really the permaculture idea is if we want to have a culture, we, our food supply doesn't, we, we, let's make it so that it, it, it increases in productivity with less input of, from the outside over time. So, you know, and you can see when we moved here all the way down to the red roof house it was just a big field. So in 15 years, and which isn't really that long in the, in the scope of our life, we already have this emergent forest ecology. And, um, that's all very human scale. You know, there's a lot of productivity, but it's still, it's like one giant garden. I love that aspect of the farm. I feel, when I'm here on my farm, I just feel so in love with everything that's around me. I, I look at the flowers and the bees and the trees and the birds and my dog and 
you know, the people that are around us. Everything is, it has so much vitality in it, so much, really, this love in it. Before opening up Chocolate Tree, I actually lived in England for five years and never thought I'd even live in America ever again. And one of the reasons, one of the basic reasons is I felt like what was going on in the, on the worldwide, but especially in America, wasn't sustainable. And I found a lifestyle in England that was much more sustainable. I mean, they've been there 2,000 years on that little island. And even though there's commerce and there's, there are huge cities there, world-class cities, it seems to work. The balance of farms and agriculture to uh, larger communities and cities, it's in balance. Uh, their way they use uh, fuels is in balance, more, more so than here. I'm not saying that they've got all the solutions there. And I was just uh, really happy that there's no GMO there and uh, bovine growth hormone is uh, illegal there. Um, everything they do has got a purity to it. Be and one of the reasons is that people are really connected to the soil. They're connected to their food source. And so when Monsanto came in there and wanted to start growing uh, GMO uh, experimental crops, people just started pulling them out of the ground. They just wouldn't allow it. It just never happened. This has absolutely become a chosen lifestyle versus running away from something else. Absolutely. And it, it's something that I encourage everybody to get to. It's something that's missing. I think we, with all of our technology, all of our smartphones and, and, and the ability to get here and there within just a few hours, it's wonderful. But um, you know, the connection to the earth, knowing where your food came from, even just common sense. You know, uh, there's something about stepping on the forks of a rake and having that thing hit you in the forehead and having those simple consequences <laughs> teaches you something incredible. And you know, growing food is not always the most funnest thing. But uh, I would say that that really is the basis of common sense and practicality. And it's something that's completely missing from our collective. The thing I try to do now is, um, in fact, I think we put this in the tagline of a lot of our stuff at permies.com is um, rather than, you know, being angry at bad guys, let's try to build good things or learn good things. Um, it's just that fighting that, that political fight, uh, I think, I, I, I'm tired. I, I think it's important that people keep fighting it, but I'm, I'm just weary of it. Uh, and I, I prefer the idea of like, let's, let's, build, some, let's build some good things and, and we can kind of get, kind of get that whole area rolling and maybe maybe we can build a, 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 a brighter future. More and more people are doing urban agriculture, um, community supported agriculture, community gardens, going to their farmers market. Um, for the first time in 50 years we actually have more new family farms. We've quadrupled the number of community gardens, we've quadrupled the number of farmers markets. Um, uh, this is how step by step um, all of us taking, doing our own part, we can, we can um, transfer these systems. So know that there's other people doing it with you. It's becoming more and more affordable. Every, every step we take um, is a step towards making that just and sustainable future possible. So thank you for every step you take. Each and every one of us can make a difference. We can do everything in our power to help regenerate the food supply, take back control of our lives, and give power and a brighter future for our children and our grandchildren, for our nephews and our nieces, and for our local community and our global community. And we can do this together if we apply these principles we spoke about, if we apply permaculture, if we apply regenerative sustainability, if we start growing things in our windowsills and in our gardens and in our community gardens and connecting with co-ops and getting connected with farmers markets and starting our own co-ops and starting our own farmers markets and doing all of these things little by little whatever you can to help revitalize our food and our water and our soil we will make a difference and we will turn this ship around I can see it happening and I invite you into that vision with me and I appreciate and honor you for being a part of it so thank you and tomorrow night, I look forward to sharing episode three with you where we dive deeply into 
the health of our bodies, the health of our minds, the health of our emotions, and the health of our relationships, and look at what does sustainable health look like from a multifaceted and very deep perspective. So please share this with everybody you know and love. And I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow night's episode.